How will we power our future? Can we create a healthy and clean economy? Climate One at the Commonwealth Club is at the forefront of the global debate about energy, economy, and the environment. Bringing together the brightest and most provocative leaders of our time, Climate One is the place where big ideas get heard. With thoughtful and insightful discussions on policy, business, science, and culture, Climate One founder Greg Dalton gets to the heart of the matter. It's our future. It's time to come together. The scope and size of global climate change can be overwhelming and often lead to detachment. The problem is so big and so difficult that we just don't want to think about it. On the show today, we discuss how practicing mindfulness can help one cope with the dark reality and get to a place of empowered acceptance and action. Christiana Figueres, the architect of the Paris Climate Agreement, joins us to share her own journey from despair to authentic optimism. Christiana Figueres is the godmother of the Paris Climate Accord, as the United Nations... <laughs> okay, I've never heard that one before. <laughs> Good, we'd like to... As the United Nations chief climate negotiator, she played a, a key role in leading the international community from the failed Copenhagen summit in 2009 to the triumphant Paris summit six years later. Today, she's supporting the Paris Accord as the convener of Mission 2020 and other campaigns. On the show today, we will hear about her personal and spiritual journey at the height of climate diplomacy. Her success was fueled by a secret source of energy that we'll hear about. Later in the show, we'll continue the exploration of higher consciousness and lower carbon emissions with two leaders of mindfulness, Meg Levy and Josh Friedman. This program is generously underwritten by the Susie Tompkin Buell Foundation. And I'd like to thank her. She was with me in the Arctic at the very beginning. So let's thank her and welcome Christiana. Thank you, Ben. Greg, can I, can I say something before you sure. put your first question out? Sure. Um, you called Copenhagen a, a failure. Um, I, I just would like to share a different way of looking at it because I don't think it's helpful actually to put those negative labels even on an experience that for me was incredibly um, difficult and for many of us who call ourselves the survivors of Copenhagen. I actually think that Copenhagen was the most successful failure of the United Nations. And it was, it was a failed attempt at reaching a global agreement, but it was incredibly successful in teaching all of us what not to do. Mm. And those mistakes that we make are equally important as teachers as the successes that we have. And so... I, I actually would like to rescue the reputation of that, you know, that conference to elevate it to say, wow, what a teaching, mm. what a teaching. Mm -hmm. And we don't always reach success, you know, the first time that we go at something. Would we have had the Paris Agreement without the lessons from Copenhagen? Probably not. So I think it's just really important to, to shift that, right? And actually to be grateful for the fact that it was it was such a you know such a book of learnings. Well, here, we're in Silicon Valley where there's a saying: "Fail early, fail often." Mm, and there people, you go. Uh, kind of turn that around. Failure is very is, is a badge of uh, courage or experience here in Silicon Valley. In diplomacy and politics, there's not a lot of space for failure, um, and that's so. Thank you for reframing. Copenhagen as a as a teaching and a learning teaching moment, yeah. Um, that that enabled something else to 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 happen later. I, I vividly remember your predecessor, um, Ivo de Boer, who was you know led the United Nations Climate Summit uh, negotiations in your position, and he was pretty fried and grizzled at the end of. Uh, seemed like you know been a long haul for him. You came in and and took over that position, and then you have been open somewhat about you hit bottom, holding literally the weight of the world on your shoulders in this position. Tell us about that experience when you hit bottom and kind of came, found Buddhism as a way out. Yeah, I guess there were two different moments. One was um, just walking into that responsibility. Um, and, and I do remember um, the first press conference that I had when, you know, we were all still riling from the 
pain of um of Copenhagen and I was asked by a um a journalist and I had not done my press training so my press team was sitting there you know going like oh my god what is she going to say because the question was so miss figueres and when do you think we're ever you know do you think we're ever going to be able to reach a global agreement and the first thing that came out of my mouth was not in my lifetime <laughs> <laughs> really helpful right <laughs> so my press team is like frozen over there <laughs> let's get her some press training um but but again it was a fantastic teachable moment for me, right? Because I had actually never thought about that question. I had never thought about the consequences of not having a global agreement. And the moment that it came out of my mouth, I kind of looked at myself, you know, when you have a distance or something, going, hold it, who is that person who just said that? Because that is so irresponsible and it is so unacceptable. And that's the moment when I said, right, My commitment here is to change that because I think I had voiced the global mood on climate change mm. and I I realized my commitment and my task here is to change that global mood. And of course I can't change the global mood before I change myself because as we know all change starts with self. So that started off a journey. And then it, but it, a few years into the job you hit you were having a difficult personal time. Also, yeah, I mean, everything comes together, right? It's a mm. wonderful package that life gives you. The United Nations terms, at least for the convention, for the climate convention, are three-year um, terms. And at the end of my first term, I was asked by the Secretary General, will you do a second one? And I was like, can I think about that? Because I was having a traumatic situation in my uh, in my personal life, um, I was exhausted from working 27 hours a day, eight days a week, um, and I just thought, you know, I, this process really needs someone who can come with just incredible strength and um, and renewed vigor. Um, and I was seriously thinking of saying thank you, but you know, let's find someone else. And um, as life would have it. My brother and sister, who have lived in Costa Rica their whole life, um, expressed their interest in celebrating my sister's 50th birthday, that was August of that year, by coming to Europe to see a glacier for the first time in their life. And I thought, wow, that, I, that is such a beautiful, right? So I said, my treat, you come up, I will organize the whole thing. So they came over uh, and I chose, you know, the glacier that I thought that they would really enjoy, uh, glacier that I had never had the honor of meeting. And, um, and we went up in the gondola uh, in Austria. We went up in the gondola. And I remember coming to the point in the gondola where you begin to see the top of the mountain. And I just totally lost my breath because there was nothing white. There was no ice. It was a completely brown, bare top of the mountain. Um, so, you know, a completely iceless glacier is not what you expect. And the impact was so deep on me that I remember stepping out of the gondola with my brother and sister and just falling to my knees right there and saying, right, This is a lesson learned. It doesn't matter if I'm exhausted. It doesn't matter, you know, if I'm in full pain. I just got to do it. So I, after we got down, I called the ESG, the Secretary General, and I said, sir, three more years of service. Here we go. Um, and sometimes you just really need those knocks, right? You just really need those knocks to understand that, um, We're, we're, we're not here to just embark on the easy stuff. I mean, honestly, right? How, 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 how boring would it be if you're just here for the easy stuff? We're here to engage with the difficult challenges that are given to us and to be able to embrace them with courage, with love, with happiness, um, with determination, and with a vision. And know that, you know, this is something that needs to be changed and it is going to be changed. How exactly? We never know at the beginning. But you've 
got to say this situation is unacceptable. It is morally unacceptable. It is financially stupid. It is environmentally terrifying. It is humanly unacceptable. And we're going to change this. And honestly, in that moment, you know, I didn't know exactly how we were going to do it, but you just, you just have to set the goal and then go at it and go at it with extreme and deep love for, uh, for this planet, for all human beings on this planet who all deserve, particularly those who are not here yet, they all deserve the, um, and have the right to, um, to a life with dignity and a life with happiness um, and with well-being, and if we do not address climate change in a timely fashion, that's not going to happen. So mm. there we are. Thank you for for sharing that. Um, and there came a, a point where tissues we, are in order. Yeah, tish, yes, not you, yes. There you go. Thank not you. Of, we don't um, normally have them, but thank you for for sharing that. And there was a time where where you found Buddhism or if you say it literally fell in your lap yeah. at a time where you were not sure you could personally go on. You were thinking some really scary thoughts. Yeah, I guess Buddhism did find me because um, I, I was in yet another crisis. And I was very seriously considering, you know, well, hmm, do I stay here or should I actually move to the next life? Because I'm not quite sure. Uh, whether I can endure this. So I was in that, you know, just absolute horrible crisis, tr truly wondering, you know, should I, should I stay here or should I move on, help myself to move on. And I wrote to a friend in Costa Rica, I wrote him an email, and I said, uh, I'm having a really hard time. I'm having serious suicidal thoughts, um, and I just need to do something. So he writes back, and he goes, well, so what do you want to do? And out, out of nowhere, I have no idea where, the word Buddhism came into my mind. So I'm like, Buddhism. And he goes, Buddhism? What do you know about Buddhism? I said, nothing. I don't even know how it's spelled, but I need it. I could just picture him, right, through his, through his email. So he sent me a link to a Buddhist monastery, Plum Village, Thai's, uh, Thai, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh's, uh, monastery in France. And I opened up the link and I read a little bit. Um, and I said, this is exactly what I need. I, I need something that is going to help me discover the real me inside of me and ground me back into where I came from and where everything comes from. And I said, I, I totally need this, but I don't have the physical energy to get myself to France. There's just no way that I can do that. Uh, so he says, okay, 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 I'll find something else. And... So then he sends me another link, and it was Thai's monastery in Germany. And it was 45 minutes from my house. And I said, I could do that. And Thai's teaching saved my life. They really did. They saved my life. Um, and honestly, they are um, also guidance that I used, but that I saw emerging very quickly in how we brought everyone together under the Paris Agreement. Did you share this quiet source of calmness and energy with other people, or did you, even from Buddhist countries or Asian nations, or did you keep it to yourself? No, I kept it to myself because, um, b because we were working in a very intercultural, interfaith, international um, space, and I did not want the fact that something that had touched me so deeply and had been so meaningful to me to be interpreted as um, an imposition on anyone else. I mean, this was good for me, but um, everyone who was there was being helped by something else. So it was it was certainly my guidance and the light in, in my life, but it didn't have to be everybody else's. Um, but what it did help me was to maintain an inordinate amount of calm in moments of total crisis in the negotiations. There's something called the hope police, which is people think that climate people need to be hopeful because uh, darkness paralyzes people. Do you ever find or s sense fake optimism? People who kind of think that I should be optimistic more than I really am because that's what will be effective. I see a lot of that in climate people saying, 
I'm really not going to say how dark it is because I think I should tell people it's brighter because that w will be easier to receive than the dark truth. Don't you think you can see through that? Fake optimism? Yeah. Yeah. So what's the point? I think it's widely practiced. Well, but 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 that's not the you know that's not what we pursue. We don't we don't pursue widely practiced anything. We pursue um, attitudes and actions that have an impact, which is different than popularity. Um, and yeah, I th I think you know that that alignment inside um, and the clarity of the reason why you're optimistic. We, we, in climate in particular, you can't be optimistic irresponsibly saying, oh, well, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be okay. No, no, no. no, you have to have optimism in the sense that we know that we have to engage in this challenge from a positive starting point. If you start going into your work on climate saying, well, actually, you know, it's all doom and gloom and it's not going to go anywhere. Well, guess what? It won't go anywhere. So you have to, going back to what I, you know, was sharing before, you have to have your vision very clearly in front of you. You have to know that we don't have another option but to straighten this out and then keep on that path. So that is, I would call it, you know, an, a grounded optimism. It's not irresponsible optimism. It is the fact that optimism is not the result of having achieved something, but rather the input with which you enter into a challenge. That's the difference. You enter into this challenge. You enter into this engagement with optimism because you know that we have to do this. In that sense, it's almost like it's a sacred opportunity that all of us are having right now to be alive and, um, and to be adults in the moment in which history and mankind are actually just in such incredible transformation. And that is the optimism, I think, that is helpful to make a shift. So it's not about fake optimism. It's about understanding that that's the starting point um, from which we engage with anything that is challenging. You have to catch a plane. Let's thank Christiana Figueres for joining us here today at Climate One. Joining us now are Meg Levy, an ordained Zen priest, and Josh Friedman, CEO of Six Seconds, an emotional intelligence network. We'll hear their insight on how being mindful about climate disruption can lead to clearer thought and action. Meg, let's begin with reflections on what you heard Christiana say. You were sitting listening to her. What really is coming forward for you listening to that story? I appreciate so much what she shared, but also towards the end when she was talking about um, the vision, uh, how we approach these issues, uh, what I've been thinking about recently, you know, having taught mindfulness in a secular version in companies, et cetera, for the last 10 years or so, that um, seeing how it's evolving, and there's something called the fourth foundation of mindfulness, which isn't talked about. Fourth, not forward, fourth, but fourth. No, yeah. fourth, <laughs> which isn't talked about very much, which part, it, there are many things involved in that, but one is what is the vision? What is the framing in which you, you look at the world? And I think it's very important. Buddhism actually, in some ways, is quite radical in that it asks us to look very deeply at impermanence, at change, and also at interconnectedness. And what happens if we really take that on as how we see the world? And the part of the mindfulness piece is remembering that, not just, oh, I'm doing my mindfulness practice, but as you go through the world, are you seeing that? Are you knowing that? Are you realizing that it's not just me and my separate self that has to be protected or my in-group, but we are actually deeply, vastly interconnected? So there's this idea in, in climate that, that sort of we're attached to um, you know, the glaciers that Christiana mm -hmm. talked about, the coral reefs that are dying, and every generation kind of has a, a reset for what the natural landscape was. I mean, imagine if you were an Ohlone and you came to mm -hmm. the indigenous people that occupied San Francisco and you came to it now from what you had remembered it. Would you be wowed with wonder? Mm -hmm. Would you be aghast at what has been done, paved over mm -hmm. to that beautiful landscape, mm -hmm. you know, so 
I guess what I'm getting at is can detachment, if we can detach in a Zen way, does that mean we can lessen the pain of the loss that climate is bringing to us? So, Josh? I, I think you, you can speak better to the Buddhist part of this, uh, but why do we need to detach from the pain? Mm-hmm. Like we're so uh, actively in our society, we're so actively seeking comfort. Mm-hmm. And you know, whether that's on our phones or whether that's shopping or whether that's, you know, what we drink or like, what if it's okay to be, to, to, to experience the despair. And at the very same time, you know, we look outside here mm-hmm. and can we hold those two things at once? Like it's so beautiful. It's such a gift to be right. on this yeah. planet. And we have the despair. And those two things, they don't cancel each other out. They're not, mm-hmm. they don't erase each other. Dualism in a way, yeah, right. Yeah. I just want to say I agree with you. you know? and, and I've also been um, moved hearing people talk about how do, we, how do we actually turn towards that, turn towards the pain. But in part of that, you can see how much you care. Yes. You can feel the, the, the compassion, what's there. And then underneath it's the love. And so how do we actually start to practice through that? Josh Friedman, uh, there's a lot of debate these days about the attack on science in our country, facts, you know, we've got to be fact-based, certainly climate people, scientists talk a lot about facts, um, they're important, but what is the shadow side of science and facts, and what do they do to our emotions? Well, you know, it's sort of funny, like, let's just be rational about this. <laughs> okay, well, if we're going to be rational, we're going to confront the reality that human beings are not just rational. Mm-hmm. Uh, (laughs) So I see myself as a scientist, and I love data, and what I know about neuroscience is that uh, what happens, our brains are kind of use it or lose it tools, Mm -hmm. and as we develop certain aspects of our brain, uh, we suppress others. Mm. So whatever it is we're actively using, uh, there's a set of neural networks that govern our ability to connect with our own emotions and with each other. And those are different neural networks than govern our ability to analyze uh, a quantitative data set. And so, you know, I grew up learning a lot about analyzing that quantitative data set. And as a result, my capacity to do, to activate this other neural network actually diminished. Mm -hmm. And so now I've spent the last 20 years trying to get both of those two things able to work. So I think for, um, for us to be really scientific about it is to be able to embrace why we're doing the science and to make sure that as scientists, as citizens, as human beings, we're both, we're integrating all of these different aspects of ourselves and developing ourselves in a more balanced way. I interviewed uh, Bill Nye recently, and he actually has a documentary of his life, and there's a part where they're looking at his brain to see if being famous changes someone's brain, uh, inflates certain parts, and actually the part <laughs> that actually he mentions that, that they can now see with MRIs that therapy actually changes the structure, talk therapy changes the structure of brain, as does does mindfulness, Meg Libby? Mindfulness, yes. So you know, uh, another development is understanding the difference between just um, a particular state in a given moment, though you're maybe doing some kind of practice, and if you're practicing regularly over time, especially longer practices, how that becomes actually more of a, a trait that versus like, okay, now I'm going to do my mindfulness. It's just if you actually practice that regularly, you naturally are more mindful. And an interesting um, bit of research, I, I highly recommend the book Altered Traits uh, by Richie Davidson and Daniel Goleman, which talks about some of these mo- more recent findings. But for longer-term meditators, some of the, the rumination that we naturally do in our, our brains that's all about me and myself and da 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 that actually calms down some. And then also the tendency to want to attach to our idea, the idea of ourself, to other things, that also becomes more relaxed. And one of the, one of the practices that affects it is loving-kindness meditation. Mm. So we need to broaden our understanding of what practice is. So there's mindfulness, but it also includes things like developing compassion, which additionally um, activates a very pro-social part of the brain, versus simply empathy and feeling the pain with, if you're, con- if you're actually cultivating the sense of wishing well for, 
hoping to relieve the suffering, you are shifting the way you're seeing yourself and the world. And so for me, these basic practices, how do we go to the gym in a sense and get in shape mm. so that when we're, we're in this dynamic situation and these dynamic challenges, that we're able to stay present and balanced and responsive in a sustainable way. And I think that Christiana talked about that as well, right? That extending our ability to be compassionate, mm-hmm. uh, it's, you know, even with the stranger, even with antagonist and finding that shared connectedness. But, you know, I think something we've talked about before, Greg, is about how we, in the face of something like climate, we can feel really powerless. Mm-hmm. And I think the message that I would want to leave people with is that your emotions are a source of power. And that this ability to grow compassion is one of the most powerful things we can do as human beings. Mm -hmm. And it transforms us, it transforms our relationships, and ultimately it does transform the world. It's not an easy process, but our emotions are there for a reason to guide us Mm -hmm. towards that kind of way of interacting. Something that I've done over time with Climate One interviews, 10 years interviewing people about very cerebral topics intellectual topics is to gradually get to that more personal, emotional place with people, Mm. carefully, tenderly, and often find Mm. people welcome it. Mm. They're not used to it. They may not more or less expect it from me, but I found even with very big brained people, (laughs) you know, uh, so it's often sometimes said the biggest, longest journey a person makes is from the head to the heart. That 18 inch journey. This program was generously underwritten by the Susie Tompkins Buell Foundation. Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows recorded with a live audience are available wherever you podcast. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time, everybody.